People have always been fascinated by outer space, curious about the stars, planets and extraterrestrial life. For centuries, space has remained a great mystery and a source of outlandish stories from green Martians to deadly meteorites. Slowly but surely, however, science is giving us more and more real knowledge. Thanks to satellites, space flights and moon landings, it's not science fiction anymore. What we're doing absolutely will change humanity. There is not a doubt in my mind. Entering space has become a reality with all that it entails. Because who owns space? Het risico is dat je cowboys krijgt die daar doen wat ze willen en een grote rotzooi van maken. En anderzijds dat je politieke conflict hierover krijgt. This is Backlight. Welcome to the Infinite Universe. Get your ass to Mars! Almost 50 years ago, the United States was the first country to send a manned space mission to the moon. Providing his own legendary commentary, Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The moon looks like fantastic. The idea that you go on such a strange, literally another world around you. Moet fascinerend zijn. Still, for many years, that one small step remained the only one. But on November the 25th this year, President Obama signed a new law: the U.S. Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act, also known as the Space Act. With this law, the next step has finally been taken, with far-reaching consequences. From now on, it will be possible for American companies to mine raw materials in space. The ink is still wet, but the space race can finally begin. So, our company is involved in asteroid exploration and utilization. So, what does that mean? It's it's basically um, searching for and capturing and then utilizing asteroids for the raw materials of asteroids because from that raw material that you get from asteroids you can pretty much build anything you need in space for human expansion in space. There's a, a confluence of, of capability and knowledge that has occurred in the past 10 years that has moved asteroid mining from science fiction to something that is very real and very possible. And so the first one is the cost of technology. We've gotten the price down on these satellites very, very low. But the other part is the knowledge, knowing where these asteroids are. So in the past 20 years, um, you know, we, we now know where hundreds of thousands of objects are in our solar system. And so the technology combined with the knowledge makes this something that we can actually do now. Thanks to technological developments, space travel is increasingly becoming cheaper and safer. But how do you prevent outer space from becoming the new Wild West, with the cowboys paying no heed to laws and regulations? This is Franz von der Dunk, the sheriff of outer space. He is one of the few people on Earth specialized in space law. Good morning. Good, Good morning. Vonderdunk is my name. Yeah. And do you know off the top of your head where I'm going, where our meeting is? It's, it's the space arbitration. Yes. Uh, Lost in space is the name of the session. The rest of the world still seems unaware of the Space Act. Franz Vonderdunk takes us along on his journey around the world. He gets invited everywhere to explain what this new law entails. With him, we go back in time two months, to the moment when the Space Act was announced in America. And finally, our third speaker is Professor Dr. Franz von der Donk. Um, he holds uh, the Harvey and Susan Perlman Alumni and Ottmer Chair of Space Law at Lincoln University in Nebraska. 
He not only brings an academic perspective, but has his own business in space law consulting, black holes. Franz has also been advisor to national governments, intergovernmental organisations uh, relating to space law, and he's published hundreds of works on space law, but the one that I particularly noticed was a list of the top 40 songs about space. <laughs> um, so if you don't have any questions at the end, we'll be guessing what song was number one on that list. <laughs> So Franz will be speaking about the potential um, for conflicts arising in some new developments in the US under the Space Act. From a perspective of a professor, we should realize that originally outer space was all about states. It was just, uh, as a matter of fact, about a few states. Over the last decades, we see many more states becoming involved. So a wide variety of states now suddenly get into space one way or another. And then in addition, of course, we have now the growing involvement of private enterprise. And this is, of course, in particular relevant for issues like arbitration. We see Virgin Galactic and x developing private suborbital flights. We see orbital private space flight companies like SpaceX and Boeing and Orbital Sciences. And then there is this fascinating idea of celestial bodies resources mining, space mining, as the common parlor wants to have it. Okay, with that, I'm now going to move to this famous US Space Act. So the Space Act does a lot of things, but one chapter addresses this future element of space mining, which is about to take off. There are actually two companies, Planetary Resources and Deep Space, which are ready to uh, start investing or whose investors are starting to invest, but they want to be given some legal certainty as to their rights to the minerals. With the Space Act, America is making its own space industry possible. The question is what the consequences will be for the rest of the world, because all the other countries are running behind as it stands at the moment. It's the only national act in the world right now which addresses this issue in any particular detail. I wanted to leave it at that to allow some time for discussion, but thank you very much. Juristen hobbelen in de, in de ruimtevaart meestal achter de werkelijkheid aan. Eh, zeker als het gaat om de, om de echte wetgeving of de internationale verdragen. En met name in de ruimtevaart door de technische ontwikkeling is het vaak moeilijk om te voorspellen welke kant het precies op gaat. En daar is het oude ruimterecht nog niet helemaal op berekend. Want die verdragen die ze in de 60er en 70er jaren in de VN hebben opgesteld. Hè, de United Nations Treaties and Principles on Outer Space. Die uh, zijn opgesteld in een tijd dat alleen staten. En dan eigenlijk ook alleen nog maar een handjevol staten. Uh, het, het zich kon permitteren uh, om in de ruimtevaart actief te zijn. En dus is in dit verdrag helemaal geen rekening gehouden met de mogelijkheid... of nauwelijks rekening gehouden met de mogelijkheid dat particulieren dat ook interessant zouden vinden. See, the Outer Space Treaty, the one that the United States is obligated by, including 100 plus other nations, the Outer Space Treaty doesn't explicitly prohibit asteroid resource utilization by a commercial company. But it doesn't necessarily um, explicitly allow it either. So, but the, uh, the Outer Space Treaty does require the states that are part of the Outer Space Treaty to create their own national legislation regarding, uh, regarding the use of outer space. That's what the United States is doing right now. When the treaties were written, there was a very long discussion about mining in space. And you, if, you, if you want to go back to the time that they were writing these treaties, this was the early 60s. The space race was on, there was a race to get to the moon. People thought that within 10 or 15 years, we would be living on the moon, that we would be mining these things. And so they wrote the treaties in such a way that you could pull resources off and use those resources. And so those hooks were put into the treaties. And now through the US legislation that is being promoted by our members of Congress, it makes it very explicit that US companies can indeed do that and own that property. What you teach me goes back to, I mean, when I, when I learned space law, we all learned about section one of the 1967-1 space treaty, the common heritage of mankind. Uh, how does this U unilateral US initiative uh, cope with that? And what could we draw from the maritime industry, which has done something on the middle mining? That's a very good question. Even the Moon Agreement only specifies that you cannot appropriate mineral resources in place. Which means that once you get them out of there, they are yours. 
basically like if you go out in the high seas as a fisher company, uh, you cannot say this, the fish in this 100 square kilometers is mine. But as soon as you go there and you fish in accordance with international rules, uh, overfishing and stuff like that, as soon as the fish is in your net, it's yours. And that argument, I think, applies to outer space as well. What the law provides is clarity and assurance. And that clarity is that, yes, you own those resources, and assurance to the investors that are putting money in there that, that the government will protect my investment. It, the government is backing the fact that I can do this. We, uh, we spent a significant amount of time with legal experts who have said, yes, what you're doing is perfectly legal. You, there could be issues of dispute, though. I mean, especially in the United States, you can get sued for crossing the street. And what our investors said is, you know, we don't want our money wasted in courtrooms. We want our money used in space and on asteroids. And thankfully for what our Congress has done is made sure, and then they're working to make sure that our investors' money is spent on something that is going to change humanity and is not going to be used in a, you know, paying for lawyers in a courtroom. Er zijn staten en sommige experts die beweren dat wat de Amerikanen doen uh, illegaal is. Dat het hard voor de troepen uitlopen en uh, unilateraal iets gaan regelen wat eigenlijk internationaal geregeld moet worden. En met dat laatste ben ik het wel eens, maar als je terugkijkt op, op de afgelopen 20, 30 jaar, dan is het niet gelukt om dat internationaal te regelen. Uh, en ik kan me wel voorstellen dat de Amerikanen nu zeggen van ja, maar we moeten iets, want we hebben nu een paar van die bedrijven die daar heel serieus mee bezig zijn. En dan krijg je dus allemaal gecompliceerde kwesties als, als kan een arbitragetribunaal zich uitspreken als de, als de ene partij een, Amerikaanse, een Amerikaans bedrijf is wat onder Amerikaans recht valt en dus onder die wetgeving en zich daarop zal beroepen. En de andere partij zegt van die Amerikaanse wetgeving herkennen we helemaal niet. Dat, dat, dat zijn natuurlijk het soort vragen wat je op een gegeven moment gaat krijgen. Omdat ruimtevaart internationaal is, kan het best zijn dat aan de ene kant van de, van de scheidslijn staat een Amerikaans bedrijf en aan de andere kant een Chinese overheidsbedrijf, noem maar wat. Als we niet op tijd een regime ontwikkelen over hoe je in de ruimte moet omgaan met de waardevolle stoffen die daar gevonden kunnen worden, op een manier waarop globaal de wereldgemeenschap daarmee akkoord kan gaan, dan wordt op een gegeven moment natuurlijk het risico dat iemand zegt, nou weet je wat, ik ga gewoon, wie doet me wat? Met als gevolg een kettenreactie dat anderen proberen dat dan te bevechten of, of daar tegenin te gaan. En dus conflicten, dat wordt dan wel steeds groter. We're in Jerusalem, where the annual International Astronautical Congress is taking place. Here, all the parties interested in the space race are getting together. Governments, companies and universities. There are manufacturers of spaceships, rockets and satellites, but also lawyers, students and astronauts. Here, you can catch a glimpse of the near future of space travel, asteroid mining and lunar colonization. This year's theme is Outer Space as a Gateway to the Future of Humanity. Okay, well, great meeting you. I'll see you, see you around later. later. Yeah. This conversation about asteroid resource utilization has been discussed in the academic circles for years, for 20 years, maybe even more, 30 years. Now it's happening because the industry is there, and the industry is pushing this forward. What will tomorrow look like? Our world is at its limits. And yet, we all want more. And why not? Why shouldn't the future be brighter than today? But where will it come from? Simple. Our tiny planet sits in a vast sea of resources, including millions of asteroids bathed in the sun's free energy 24 hours a day. The same rocks that could fall from our skies also contain everything we could ever need both out there and down here. It's time someone seized the opportunity. Deep Space Industries. So th there's three things we're looking for on asteroids. Two of them we plan on leaving in space, and one, one group we'll take back. Uh, the first 
thing we're looking for is water. Water seems to make no sense to most people when you think about it. Why would you bring water back to Earth? And that's why we're not bringing water back. But water in space is incredibly valuable. Um, it, it serves a variety of functions in space. Uh, if, you're, if you're an astronaut, you sure would love something to drink. Uh, it's also good for growing food in space. And if I take water and I split water in half, I've got liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. I've got rocket fuel. The other thing we're, uh, that are on asteroids are metals. Uh, so things like nickel and iron. Um, again, something we wouldn't bring back to Earth because we've got iron and steel and, and things like that here. But if you want to build something in space, the best thing to do is to use what you've got there. And so we will we'll use those resources that we find in space to build uh, new structures for space stations or habitats or whatever else. The third one is the one that people seem to like the most, and that's platinum. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of platinum locked up in asteroids and platinum group metals. And that's what we would bring back to Earth because platinum group metals are extraordinarily scarce on Earth. We're not finding any more. We're closing down mines here on Earth because we're running out of platinum to, to mine. And that's what we would bring back to Earth is these platinum group metals. Asteroids have the raw materials that you need to, to develop two things. A space infrastructure, the actual infrastructures in space, structures such as uh, free-floating structures, such as uh, gas stations in space, when humans continue to explore space as they move forward, they're going to need to refuel, they're going to need, to, they're going to need water, they're going to need structures that need to de be developed in space because it's cheaper to develop structures in space than it is to lift them off the ground. It's something like $11,000 per pound of mass to lift from Earth. So that's very expensive, so that's not economically sustainable to develop a space infrastructure and a space economy. We have a saying in the company that uh, the most valuable resource in space is people. Eventually we will get to the point where there are people in space, and that those people in space are going to need resources to survive and live. So we have, a, we have a, a business plan that makes us a profitable company right now, but of course, our long-term dream, just like you've heard from Elon Musk at SpaceX, where Elon wants to create a colony on Mars, our plan is, well, let's provide the infrastructure uh, and resources for those colonies and people to do exploration. The idea of human beings in space has always inspired the imagination. In the future, this is only likely to grow. The European Space Agency has prepared a presentation about the boundless opportunities of this idea. As we look forward towards Mars, if we can get resources off the moon, the, the uh, oxygen and hydrogen, that can be a tremendous change in the way we would do Mars-class missions if those volatiles are available to us and we can pull those off the surface. So we have several investigations uh, aimed in that direction. In the coming years, we will see explorers at the lunar poles, exploiting the extended sunlight for power and performing research to benefit life on Earth and to understand our place in the universe. This new exploration will be achieved, not in competition as in the past, but through peaceful, international cooperation. In the future, the moon can become a place where the nations of the world can come together to understand our common origins, to build a common future, and to share a common journey beyond. A place where we can learn to move onwards into the solar system. Over the years, there have been several manned missions, resulting in a select group of so-called spacewalkers. Most spacewalkers are not so well known, but everyone knows Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Good morning and shalom. My name is Soichi Noguchi. I'm a Japanese astronaut. I'm the president of Association of the Space Explorers. And I am proud to say I'm a spacewalker. Okay. Right. 
Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, is no longer with us. But the second moonwalker, Buzz Aldrin, at 85, is still alive and kicking. He's a star among astronauts. Association of Space Explorers and IAF. And, uh, I have In 1969, these feet were standing on the moon. They are taking him all over the world, promoting space exploration. Huh? Take the whole outer shirt off. Yeah, probably, and, put, and then turn the mask around and put it on. The very first speaker, Dr. Buzz Aldrin. dat er nu nog een man of zeven of acht dat echt kunnen navertellen. En dat, die zijn natuurlijk allemaal hoog in de zeventig of begin tachtig. Dus die zullen niet meer heel lang onder ons zijn. En uh, nou ja, naar mijn inschatting zal het nog wel tien jaar duren voordat er iemand voet op de maan zet. Dus het kan zijn dat we binnenkort een situatie hebben waar niemand meer weet wat het is om daadwerkelijk op een andere wereld gestaan te hebben. Als het safe is zou ik wel ook nog een keer naar de maan willen, absoluut, ja. I want to leave everyone here with one small message, and it is get your ass to Mars! All right, thank you. Hello? One copy, please. Thanks. Thank you. Are you an astronaut by any No. So what about why the... Because they're filming about space law. They're, I'm a space lawyer and they're doing a program on, uh, on, uh, on space law. Uh, Developments and one of the developments is that we like looking this. for looking for uh, for. Als je het hebt over die SpaceX bijvoorbeeld in Amerika, dan, dan, dan zou ik van harte toejuichen dat daardoor een internationale dialoog ontstaat die ertoe leidt dat, of het nou precies de SpaceX volgt of niet, dat er wel een soort internationale overeenstemming komt over zo moeten we ermee omgaan. Want als dat er niet komt, dan wordt het risico van uh, vergelijkbaar met wat hier religieus gebeurt en nog steeds gebeurt, uh, dat zoiets in de ruimte ook gaat plaatsvinden, dat, dat wordt dan wel steeds groter, dat risico. Als je het hebt over vrede in de ruimte, dan bedoel je toch enerzijds dat men de ruimte niet gebruikt om op aarde elkaar verder schade toe te brengen. Nou, we hebben nog geen wapens vanuit de ruimte zien neerdalen op aarde, hoe, hoeveel, hoeveel oorlogen er ook zijn geweest. En anderzijds dat je niet probeert elkaar pijnlijk te treffen in de ruimte. Nou, dat is iets waar we wel een beetje voor moeten oppassen. Je hebt natuurlijk allerlei satellieten die eventueel ook gevoelig zijn voor, voor cyberaanvallen. En waarmee navigatienetwerken of communicatienetwerken verstoord kunnen worden. En omdat we wel veel meer, steeds meer afhankelijk zijn van dat soort netwerken, wordt dat risico wel steeds groter. Is dat oorlog? Is dat een verstoring van de vrede? Nou, niet letterlijk, want er is geen gewapend geweld, komt er bij aan de orde. Maar als je in een hele stad of een heel land uh, weet, weet uh, qua communicatie of qua, qua energie weet plat te leggen, omdat je een paar cruciale satellieten uit het systeem weet uit te schakelen, weet te hacken, nou ja, dan kunnen er ook daardoor doden vallen of een hoop schade. Dus dat komt dan toch wel een beetje in de buurt. Het woord vrede is natuurlijk, krijgt een hele andere kleur en context als je het hebt over de ruimte, absoluut.
more and more countries are planning to go into space. A surprising new player at the table is the United Arab Emirates. In 2020, they want to be the first Arab country to set foot on Mars with a manned mission. And they need von der Dunk for that. In the Emirates, space travel is still in its infancy, but following the United States, they still wish to play a leading role. They are focusing on space tourism, transportation and mining. As they lack all the necessary knowledge for this, they have hired a team of specialists. One of them is Peter Marquez, an expert on the lucrative raw materials market. The uh, UAE uh, leadership has has made a very, in my view, a very wise decision to go forward uh, on a variety of, of space activities. And they have created uh, a space agency to oversee all this new activity. And in the process of doing that, uh, the space agency has asked for uh, people from around the world to come in and share their experience and knowledge of how they did space activities in their country. And so that's why I'm here uh, to talk about some of the policy issues and things at a national government level, how you would operate. And that's why Franz is here to talk about law and international law as it applies to space. He's widely recognized as a global expert on space law. So he's one of the people that you seek out his advice on, on space legal issues. Uh, and if you haven't sought his advice, then you have a gaping hole in your understanding of space law. Uiteindelijk komt het op neer, toch op een lange termijn perspectief. Abu Dhabi heeft voor de eerste 20 of 30 jaar nog voldoende olie, dus ze zou theoretisch kunnen denken van oh, waar maken we ons zorgen over. Maar blijkbaar is de sheik, of zijn de sheiks hier vooruitziend genoeg om zich te realiseren dat dat over 20 of 30 jaar ophoudt. Het zij de wereld is niet meer geïnteresseerd in olie of de olie is op of wat er dan ook gebeurt. Het totale plaatje is omgegooid. Nu hebben ze nog het geld om ervoor te zorgen dat ze tegen die tijd dus dan niet meer als een, als een kaart dus in elkaar zakken. Dat ze zorgen voor andere sectoren. Dus space wordt gezien als een van de sectoren waarin als je er nu in investeert. En dat kost natuurlijk een, een slordige duit. Maar die hebben ze dus op dit moment nog. Dat je dan over 10 of 15 jaar een, een, een eigen capaciteit opbouwt die... Uh, zeg maar voldoende economische activiteit genereert om te vervangen dat je dan misschien niet meer zoveel aioli hebt. The entire team of specialists is being convened by the Emirates' new UAI Space Agency at the exclusive Armed Forces Officers Club. Here, each specialist is told what is expected of him behind closed doors. هذه الانطلاقة ما هي سوى بداية رحلتنا في الفضاء المريخ بداية والكواكب الأخرى محطات النجوم تتحرك ببطء من خلال هذا الضوء الباهت بلوني الأخضر والأحمر كأن الفضاء ينادي باسم الإمارات ألوان عالمي وطني إماراتي Oil is what has made the Emirates so rich, and their space program is funded with oil money. But as this source of funds will dry up in the future, they plan to obtain their income from another precious material, platinum. 
you're talking about access to critical resources on a level that is, I can't even put my head around it. Um, the, the amount of platinum that is on a, a single 100 meter asteroid, an asteroid that we know has platinum on it, a one 100 meter asteroid has more platinum on it than has been mined in the history of humankind. Just one. And we know where many of these are. So we're talking about access to scarce resources on a scale that, that we have never seen in, in, our, in, in the history of our species. There are a variety of ways that the current scarcity of platinum is holding back humankind. But then there are ways that you and I can't even imagine right now that platinum could be used. An example that we often discuss at the company is aluminum. Aluminum at one time was one of the more precious metals on the entire planet. Through scientific discovery, we found a process for making aluminum, and now we use aluminum to wrap our food in. We fly in airplanes made out of aluminum. Um, you know, it, it fundamentally changed how we operate as, as people. Als je als eerste de, de eerste kladversie maakt, dan stuur je natuurlijk al heel erg de richting waarin het opgaat. Ja, goed, ze hebben mij natuurlijk gehuur, gehuurd omdat de, de expertise in ruimtevaartrecht hier vrijwel nieuw is. Dus het meeste van wat ik daarin zet, slikken ze als gesneden koek, zal ik maar even zeggen. Is het een spannend proces voor je? Ja, want het is wel voor het eerst dat ik zo aan de bron van het schrijven van een wetgeving zit. Ik heb in het verleden wel, ben ik wel betrokken geweest bij meerdere nationale ruimtewetgevingen. In Nederland, een poging om het in Duitsland te doen, in Brazilië, een poging om het in Japan te doen. Maar dan word je als adviseur bijgehaald. Hè. Het zijn dan lokale mensen die echt de wet schrijven. Maar dus dan is mijn input beperkt tot, oké, okay, nou dit zijn een beetje de kaders. Maar nu ben ik echt gaan zitten, oké, okay, wat moet er in artikel 1, weet je? Nou, dat moet erin en dat moet ik dan zo definiëren. En dat is voor het eerst dat ik dat doe. Tegelijkertijd was ik er een paar keer dichtbij genoeg geweest... om niet het idee te hebben van... oh mijn god, wat wordt er nou van mij verwacht, weet je? Dus ik, ik durfde de uitdaging wel aan. En vooral omdat ik natuurlijk omdat ik ook weet dat er nog een, een proces zit... waardoor alles gevalideerd wordt. Ik bedoel, als het eindresultaat waardeloos zou zijn... dan kunnen ze niet alleen mij daarvan de schuld geven, begrijp je? The lunatic is on the grass And if your head explodes The dark propose to I'll see you on the dark side of the moon Deep Space Industries has been invited to a technology festival in The Hague, where Sagi Kafir and one of the founders of the company are giving a presentation about the future of humanity. Good afternoon. Welcome to the revolution. Today we're going to talk about what is happening and is about to happen in space and how it relates to, shall we say, civilization. My vision of the future in space is an expanding civilization. I see cities floating between the worlds that are rotating, that have people living in them, that have created environments where they want to live. I see lights on the moon. I see cities on Mars. Um, you know, I love the idea of planting a tree on the moon, you know, or watching a butterfly land on a flower on Mars. I mean, that sounds really quaint and corny, but that's the thing for me. For me, you know, a transcendental moment is to walk out into a pasture in Texas, way far away from the city, and hearing the, the creatures of the night and the crickets 
and the city lights are so far away that I can look up and actually see the Milky Way, you know, or I can see the moon and, and you know, and just really get a feeling that it's right there. You know, and I, I, I often, sometimes I'll walk out in the middle of the night uh, when I'm out there like that, and I'll look up and I go, we're coming. We're coming, man. You know, it's, it's like, I'm coming. I'm coming. So you've got things like this. These are pretty big things. These are communities. These are cities in space. And by the way, we are destination agnostic. The moon, Mars, doesn't matter. It's all about a community of people taking on the unknown and transforming it into the near known into the place where they're going to be, where they're going to live. The mining of raw materials is a prerequisite for the next step in space, the building of settlements. Then nothing will stand in the way of humans colonizing space. Now people can find it's as if history is repeating itself. In the 19th century, kind of hordes of settlers left Europe behind for the distant and promising shores of so America. When people went to the New World, where I was born, you know, they went for all kinds of reasons. They didn't know what they were going to find there. They didn't realize they were going to, uh, you know, find a, a constitution or a bill of rights. They didn't realize they were going to find uh, or, or build a, a culture that was going to do the kind of things that our culture has done. And I don't mean to say that and sound like, oh, God, he's an American, he's so full of hubris. But, you know, I'm kind of proud of what we've done. I think we've done pretty good. Uh, but, you know, I come from a place that was created uh, to be better than the place people had left behind. And whatever we create on Mars or we create on the moon or create in space will be of the Earth but it will evolve its own way. So for example, a child that grows up on the moon under one-sixth gravity will be unique to the moon. I call that Homo lunaris. A child that grows up on Mars will be unique to Mars, Homo marsialis, okay? Homo spatialis, you know? They're going to be their own species. They're gonna do their own thing. But and then they declare independence and then they fight the mother country, the mother planet. It's inevitable. It always happens. You know, I don't care whether so they... So this all ends in war? No, no, they go their own way. It's funny, every time, I don't care what culture you're from, if you go somewhere else, eventually you begin to identify as citizens of that place, and the people that sent you there are those people. They don't understand us. We are now independent. I don't care if the people... And this is what's kind of interesting. It's kind of hopeful whether the people that go to the moon and Mars are from Russia or China or Connecticut, once they get there, they're basically at some point going to say, screw you, we are the people of the moon. We are the people of Mars. You don't understand us. We are independent. It doesn't matter where they come from. It's October 2015. Von der Dunk has arrived in Washington. The place is abuzz with rumors about the Space Act. Will it be passed or not? Here binnen moeten ze tot overeenstemming komen tussen het Huis van Afgevaardigden en de Senaat, want die hebben hier een eigen versie in eerste instantie over een gemeenschappelijke tekst. En dat kan ieder moment gebeuren. Ik verwacht oppositie, maar ik verwacht ook dat die oppositie vooral politiek gericht is. En daar bedoel ik mee dat landen als China en Rusland niet zozeer op de inhoudelijke juridische aspecten gaan bekritiseren, maar op het algemene de suggestie dat dit weer een vorm van Amerikaans imperialisme is, uh, uh, vooruitlopen op de rest van de wereld. En uh, nou ja, jullie volgen of jullie volgen niet, dat is jullie keus. Uh, want ik, ik vraag me serieus af of je juridisch hier heel veel problemen mee kan hebben. 
Dat wil niet zeggen dat, we, uh, dat het niet alsnog kan ontsporen, want uiteindelijk gaat het erom hoe de gedetailleerde wetgeving die dan later ontwikkeld moet worden, dat gaat invullen. En daar kunnen nogal dingen ontstaan waarvan ik zeg van, hé, hey, daar, daar, daar wil ik toch een stokje voor steken als internationaal jurist. Het, het risico is, is enerzijds dat je, dat je cowboys krijgt die daar doen wat ze willen en een grote rotzooi van maken. En anderzijds, en die twee liggen natuurlijk wel in elkaars verlengde, dat je politieke conflict hierover krijgt. Dat, dat, dat andere landen, dat die gaan zeggen van als jullie dat gaan doen, dan gaan wij het ook doen en we gaan misschien wel dwars door jullie plannen heen fietsen. Dat, dat zijn de risico's die ik zie. Ik denk nog dat de United States has a nuclear facility on the dark side of the moon. There's always these conspiracy theories. Damn, they know about that? They know about it, they heard. I didn't leak it, did you? <laughs> no, but, it, but in all seriousness, no matter what approach we take, there'll always be that element in the international community that, that still thinks the United States is the boogeyman and it's all a conspiracy yep. world. We're here to take over the powers of, of space. Space is kind of big. There is a little bit of room for everybody to come get involved. Absolutely. Absolutely. We want our, com our competitors, the other companies. We want other countries. We want everybody to get involved. It isn't a matter of the United States saying we own space. There are some people that may come out and say, oh my God, here they go again. It's the Americans. You know? Of course that will happen. Of course it's going to happen. Be, because all those damn Americans, you can't trust them. So that's what they, that's what they tell you. Absolutely. Yeah. There are and, people and that don't trust anything anybody from the United States does. Uh, you know, you're just going to have to judge us by what we do. Uh, I can sit here and tell you all day long that our intentions are great. And if you don't believe my intentions are great, you're gonna hold your belief. And everything I do that isn't absolutely clear, you're going to take as, oh my God, they're changing the law so they can, you know, American dominion, they're jingoistic frontier grabbing bastards who are gonna somehow, you know, fine. Just watch what we do. In Washington, lawyers, lobbyists, and companies active in the space industry are gathering for their annual meeting. The theme is, what are the risks of the Space Act? But actually, everyone is waiting anxiously for the act to be ratified. No one knows when this will happen, but Peter Marquez is well connected and knows a bit more than the rest. Well, I do have white smoke on another issue. Okay. Yes. The uh, Senate is voting tonight under unanimous consent rules on the bill. Our bill. Wow. So, so to tonight. Mm -hmm. So the, the bill is essentially done. And then it's just the president which has to sign. And the president signs it and we've talked to the White House and the White House says they're on board. So Wow. So then it's just a procedural So we can have already a small party tonight. Yeah, I mean we don't even need to have the conference today. I say we just start the party now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, sure. We, but we as UNL have to take care of our audience, right? We can't just say, okay, so, here's so, a glass so of wine. You can uh, discuss then in, in our Oh I'm not discussing this in this group. You I'm, can't? I'm not okay. I'm not discussing okay. it at all. Okay. I think we should keep this between ourselves all right. All right. and let the Senate <laughs> get its vote underway first. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm not one for snatch, snatching defeat well, from the jaws of yeah. victory. My background is actually uh, in uh, government uh, policy, uh, national security space, uh, and space policy issues. So I worked uh, for the U.S. government for over a decade, uh, working space policy there, and spent uh, eight years in the Pentagon working national security space programs, and then uh, was the uh, space policy director in the White House for uh, two presidents. Again? You were? I was the space, space policy, policy director at the White House for uh, President Bush and President Obama. Really? Yeah. The same evening, the Space Act was passed by a large majority of Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. That's why I like you, Mike. <laughs> in November 2015, the law was signed by President Obama. A new era is dawning. It was our firm belief, and I think many in the international legal community, that there was an inferred right to uh, obtain property in space, to, to recover resources and own those resources. But none of that was explicit. So when a company like mine goes in to talk to uh, investors, they say, okay, 
we actually, we're, we're, we're cool with the technology. We actually believe you can go do this. But when the dog catches the car, what's the dog going to do? You know, are you going to be able to protect my investment that I'm putting into this company? And that was always a concern. And we would say, well, you know, the law allows it. And they said, well, it allows it, but is it explicit? Can I actually bank on this, literally bank on it? This has given us a tremendous level of certainty that will unlock a, a vast amount of investment resources and also give us certainty in what we can do in the future. Um, and so that's, that's a tremendous, tremendous thing. And, and it's a historic thing, in my opinion. One little paragraph in Title IV of a commercial space bill is, is tremendously historic. And I don't think that should be lost on anybody here or in the public as to what is happening now. That 50 years of discussion and, and hand-wringing has at least been made very, very clear here in the United States. And I think that's important to note. So. so how do you feel about the, um, how do you feel about the... Good. We got, I mean, we got the, the big whale in the boat. We got property rights. Yeah. I think now... No, I'm, I'm, worried about the, I'm not even worried about the international. I wouldn't even go overseas to talk about it. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, these are the questions we're going to be asked. Yeah. So at least the lobbyists will be employed. What's that? At least the lobbyists will be employed for the next couple of years. I have to manage all them. So... Yeah, we'll get it figured out, but you know what? The first enormous step is taken. So, congratulations. Je zou kunnen zeggen dat dit een kleine stap is, een krabbel onder een wetgeving van een paar pagina's die een hele grote stap voorwaarts betekent. Misschien dat we er over 3000 jaar nog van profiteren. Misschien dat als de mensheid over 3000 jaar erin geslaagd is om andere habitats dan de aarde te creëren, zodat we niet alleen maar afhankelijk zijn van die aarde, die natuurlijk toch tamelijk kwetsbaar aan het worden is, dat we dan dit zullen zien als een belangrijke stap in dat proces. Ik zou het dolgraag doen. Dan kijk je niet naar de aarde als één groot geheel, maar dan kijk je naar de aarde als een klein knikkertje in het onmetelijke heelal. Bewustwording van de kwetsbaarheid van de aarde en van de onnozelheid van alle oorlogen. Vanuit de ruimte zie je geen grenzen. Zie je alleen maar een prachtige blauwe, groene, gele planeet. Dat moet fascinerend zijn. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.